distinguished guest speakers today and also leading journalists from all over the world and from all over Europe who are joining today's press roundtables as well as the audience and other journalists who join us and follow us via the live stream on YouTube. So it's Friday afternoon, 5 p.m. and we really thank you very much for being with us and for doing this this afternoon. This is due to the reason that we actually wanted to do the launch event, the physical uh, launch event in Vienna City Hall this afternoon, starting right now. But of course, due to the corona pandemic, we had to take it to the digital sphere. So we are very, very glad and proud that our initiative has found the interest and support of so many honorable guest speakers and members of the press. So thank you again to all of you. And now allow me to present our first round of speakers. We welcome Madame Vice President Dubravka Schwitzer, the Vice President for Democracy and Demography of the European Commission. Mr. Jürgen Czernohorski, Executive City Councillor for Edu Education, Integration, Youth and Personnel of the City of Vienna. Mr. Zdenek Zrib, the Lord Mayor of the capital of the Czech Republic, Prague. And Mrs. Alexandra Dukiewicz, the Mayor of Gdansk in Poland. This session will be hosted by Helfried Karl, who is the managing partner of the Innovation and Politics Institute located in Vienna. And he is also the co-founder of the European Capital of Democracy Initiative. Finally, a short technical note. After a first round of personal statements by the speakers, we kindly invite all journalists uh, to raise their hands. And now I will describe how you can do it. If you can go to the right hand side on the bottom line, there you can see participants. If you click there you can see your name and if you click on and if you go with a, a mouse on your name you can see the hand now i am raising my hand and if my question has already been answered i will i will address you to answer your uh, to ask a question then you can remove your hand please or you can write me a question in the chat if you go on my picture you see the speech bubble and then you can enter the message into the private chat to me. So now I will hand over to Mr. Helfried Karl. Helfried, the floor is yours. Thank you, Uta. And uh, thank you to all the distinguished panelists for joining us and to all of us who are following uh, on the live stream. I think it's quite a strong show of force during these challenging times and also during a Friday afternoon. I'm very honored to represent the European Capital of Democracy initiative here. About one and a half years ago, we in the Innovation in Politics Institute came up with the idea of a European Capital of Democracy. We asked, what can we do to create a positive discourse on democracy in Europe? How can we show real life experiments taking place every day in Europe by local governments of the people, by the people and for the people? And how can we ensure that others get inspired and follow suit? Because we believe we don't hear enough about the many innovative forms of democracy that are being practiced in cities all over Europe. Instead, we hear about strongmen and their lies that they represent the people and that democracy is a weak and old idea slowly to be replaced by some kind of new authoritarianism. And this gives the wrong impression that they are winning. My children tell me lately that they have no hope for the future anymore. They believe in human rights and democracy, and they want to preserve the planet. But they are swamped with bad news from all over the world about all the things that do not work. But what does it mean for their generation if they don't have any future or they feel that way? I am convinced that hope can be a very powerful political resource. If hope is taken away from us, we tend to be less courageous and less creative in the end. 
And this leads to a political cynicism or even worse. So we in the Innovation in Politics Institute decided to change the momentum to talk about what works in our democracy. We want to put the limelights on those constructive forces who deserve it and to create a beauty contest of democratic best practice with an annual selection of the European capital of democracy. How will this work? In order to become a European capital of democracy, cities will have to apply with a curated program of what they intend to innovate in their democratic practice and for their citizens. A jury of experts will evaluate their bid and make a short list of the five best cities. And then a representative online jury of 10,000 European citizens from the 47 member states of the Council of Europe will decide the winner. The European capital of democracy of any given year will then not only implement its own democratic program with its citizens, it will also serve as a stage for the European discourse on democracy in general. Expert panels, political fairs, art festivals, all of them dealing with democracy will take place in the city. Also, the European Youth Parliament will meet there, thanks to the Schwarzkopf Foundation. And we know that many will follow with the specific tracks we are organizing. We will have a track dealing with the challenges and opportunities posed for, posed for democracy in the digital age. We will have a track on climate crisis and democracy. We will have a track on education and one on participation. All this we will do with third partners. Partners who believe as we do in the European Convention on Human Rights and who believe as we do that the time has come to act. Because words can inspire, but actions can change the world and we need action. So next spring, we will publish a call asking all European citizens to compete for this honorary title. They will have one year time to complete their bid so that our group of experts can assess the applications and submit a shortlist to the citizens jury. In August 2022, the European citizens in our jury will vote. 15 September is, as you know, the dedicated International Day of Democracy. So on that day in 2022, we will know who the first elected European capital of democracy will be. Its program will start exactly one year later on 15 September 23, because obviously the cities need one year time to prepare once they have the title. This is a long time to go. So we decided that in the meantime, we will work with two partner cities yet to be selected who volunteer as European capitals of democracy in 2021 and 2022. These first two cities will demonstrate how strong the concept of the democratic of the European capital of democracy is and what can be done during a year of holding this wonderful title. The decision on pilot capitals will be taken based on the content of the program in conjunction with our experts. Who these pilot cities will be, we will inform you about this in the coming months, but I can assure you that there is already a lot of interest in this. Thank you very much. I just wanted to give an outline of the uh, initiative as such, and I would now like to hand over to uh, Madame Dubravka Schuitzer, Vice President of the European Commission for Democracy and Demography. Um, maybe I may kindly ask her to explain why she decided to join this event and even grace our launch event that we had planned for tonight with her patronage. After all, this is an initiative for cities. So uh, the question uh, begs, why is the commission getting involved in all of this, Madam Vice President? Thank you very much, first of all. And uh, um, let me uh, tell you that it is a great privilege for me as Vice President for Democracy and Demography in the European Commission to join the launch of European Capital of Democracy, also in different format this year. I would have wished to join you in person, as you know, in the beautiful city of, of Vienna, but uh, this will be for another time once uh, circumstances allow. I will immediately address your question before providing you with some information on our efforts in engaging directly with citizens. I'm very enthusiastic about this idea of an European capital of democracy. 
I can pledge here today to help it flourish and grow in the years to come. At this time of extraordinary hardship and uncertainty, as you already said, Seeing this initiative taking shape and reaffirming the crucial role of our cities as strongholds of democracy is particularly reassuring and promising. My objective from day one in, this, my, in my current role is to invest all my energy in citizens' engagement and contribute to boosting their participation at all levels of policy making. This is also the reason why I have been conducting multiple citizens' dialogues all over the European Union over the last year. It's only through direct engagement and deliberation that we can successfully and constructively go through the green and digital transition, but also manage and learn from the demographic change that is ultimately affecting the very way we live together. And there is no better way to do that but on level closest to our citizens, our cities. With this initiative, we are going back to the very origins of democracy, to the level of which democracy was initially imagined and conceptualized, the police. A city that evaluates its own democratic track record is a city that prioritizes the essence of the principle of democracy in its decision-making processes. This keeps democracy at the front front of people's minds. This is significant. A city that promotes democracy is a city that facilitates the involvement and participation of citizens in the implementation of democracy. Crucially, the European Capital of Democracy project has the potential to bring democracy closer to the citizens. I can only welcome and support such initiatives. I applaud the idea that a jury of 10,000 citizens, representative of the European population, will select the winner, and I look forward to results. As you know, democracy is one of the founding values of the European Union, and a new push for European democracy is one of the Commission's priorities under President von der Leyen. This initiative gives, gives visibility to the importance of democracy and the need to constantly protect and develop it. A well-functioning democracy is based on a relationship of trust. Prior to COVID-19 and during my listening tour of the European Union, which was stopped by COVID in, in March, I was regularly mentioning that citizens' trust is that citizens' trust in democracy cannot and should not ever be taken for granted. We must find difficult ways to get to know our citizens better, at all levels, local, regional, national, and European, so that we, that we can connect better with citizens, to establish trust, to establish solidarity, to have an honest and open debate. We must do this because democracy is having a hard time these days. People, people feel left behind. Who do they blame? They blame, they blame democracy itself. COVID-19 is itself putting additional pressure on democracy, but democracy is still the best answer to our problems. Listening to people, answering their concerns, and adjusting our policies to the needs of our citizens, whoever and wherever they are. There is nothing better. Still, we need to improve ways democracy and our own policy initiatives respond citizen, to citizens' needs. In my capacity as Vice President for Democracy, I intend to do it all also through the Conference on the Future of Europe as another opportunity to connect with citizens. For this to work, especially in these times of the pandemic, we need to use all tools at our disposal, especially digital solutions as we are doing at this moment. The exercise in deliberative democracy at first uh, at the European level is more relevant than ever before, especially in the current context. Our society has changed. We therefore, therefore need new thinking. We cannot solve new problems with outdated ways of looking at the world. Politics is no longer business as usual. The Conference on the Future of Europe is a sign of new thinking at the European level. It complements representative democracy and can increase trust in our democratic institutions. Let me take this opportunity 
<laughs> to extend my best wishes to all Viennese citizens in electing their 100 members of the Vienna City Council. Another fine example of democracy in action. I want to reiterate how much I cherish this valuable and necessary initiative. Together, let us make it an inspiration for the future of democracy and the future of our European Union as a whole. And my last and final remark, being a mayor myself for two terms, eight years, is one of the drivers to be active in this, uh, in this uh, very, very precious activity like uh, European Capital of Democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Vice President, for your uh, intervention. May I now give the floor to the representative of our host city, uh, Mr. Jürgen Czernohorski, who is Executive City Councillor for Education, Integration, Youth and Personnel in Vienna. Um, apart from your special role as a host city of, uh, of our launch, um, thinking about the democratic practices in your city, and obviously, apart from the elections that you're facing, um, is there anything that you're proud of and where you think that other cities could actually look at the example of Vienna and uh, maybe take something positive away? Schönen guten Abend aus Wien, uh, Madam Vice President, Mr. Lord Mayor, Madam Mayor. Let me start by telling you what an honor it is for me to be part of this launch event together with you. I don't know if you have seen the sun reflecting on my forehead before. It's very warm and sunny today in Vienna. It would have been a great time to meet together in person in the great festival hall in our city hall. And I'm really sad that it isn't possible due to the pandemic. And our heart goes out to every city in Europe and all over the world who is, uh, that is struggling with the pandemic right now, like Vienna is. Um, it's a hard time for, for European cities but it's a good day for European democracy and Vienna is proud to be part of it. Vienna is among the most successful cities in the world when it comes to quality of living, um, social cohesion, public infrastructure, but it is my deep conviction that to be successful, a city requires participation and cohesion. It must have the objective of enabling its cities to actively shape the city together. And I'm convinced that given the chance, people want to help shaping their city. People want to help shaping their living environment, especially in big cities of today. Because in a place where people live together closely, there, there is the constant need of continuously debating and negotiating how we want to live together. And a dem democratic city provides the framework for that. And that is why the European Capital uh, of Democracy um, initiative is so important. That is what it stands for. It's, it's about standing up for a strong Europe with resilient democracies based on our common values of social equity, well-being and human rights. Um, Helfried asked me before uh, to tell you a few things about examples from Vienna, and I'm delighted to uh, Say a few words uh, to you about an initiative that I am particularly proud of. Um, it's an example of how democracy uh, innovation can change a city. Um, it's about a project called Werkstatt Junges Wien, which basically means repair shop or workshop uh, Young Vienna. And actually it is the biggest citizen involvement project in our country's history. It's about um, our uh, initiative in the last one and a half years that um, we wanted to ask 22, uh, we, we did, we asked 22,500 children and young people in which city they want to live, what they like, what they don't like, and together with them, we phrased out a mission. We worked on a cross-sectoral children and youth strategy for Vienna, that's what it looks like. <laughs> And um, now it's, it's a, a thing we did together with all city departments. All cross-sectoral work together was to contribute to the strategy and to become the most child and youth friendly city in the world. So the mission phrased out by the children is about the steps we have to take to achieve this goal. 
Um, in June 2020, so a few months ago, the Vienna City Council, the city parliament um, adopted uh, this strategy. So now it's, uh, it's the mission for every politician, every city employee, basically for every Viennese person. It has 193 specific measures uh, that were, were adopted. And um, at the center of the whole project, there is one conviction. It's the fundamental right of all children and young people to have a say in everything that concerns them. The whole city has committed itself to that goal, to that conviction, to the results of the Werkstatt Junges Wien, beginning from the top, the mayor himself, the whole city government, and every city department. The children showed us something. They showed during the whole process that they are committed to actively shaping their city. They made the strategy for us. And um, I am very happy to tell you that the story doesn't end here. We have the strategy now, but the path of participation and empowerment of children and young people goes on. As a city, we have committed ourselves to the fact that children and young people are involved in every single step of the implementation of the strategy. So we can uh, provide constant, we want constant engagement from them. We want them to be able to develop further ideas in the years to come. We want them to keep an eye on us while their mission is being carried out by us. We also have decided that uh, the children and young people, uh, to provide the children and young people with a participatory budget of 1 million euros per year. Well, we started with warning the kids and the young people of Vienna to think about the city. But in the end, the whole city is now thinking about children and young people. That is what changed. There is an entirely new awareness, expanding conventional ideas of democracy. And that's the biggest learning for me as a city representative. It's how much we as adults can profit from a process like this. How much we can learn from the dialogue and collaboration. It didn't only empower the kids, it empowered us as a government and as a city uh, society. I think that is one example. It's an example uh, from Vienna, an example of, an, uh, of, an inno of a democracy innovation, which I am um, delighted to share with everybody who wants uh, to, to go the same way. And uh, I think it is, it's an example uh, of how democracy innovation, of how new approaches can change the city. And I think, it, it, especially cities have always been the center of democracy. But today, our cities face new challenges. One big challenge is the growing gap between uh, the people who live in a city and those who are entitled to vote, which leads to problems regarding the democratic legitimacy of uh, political decisions. And that is why I think that cities are particularly called upon to facilitate the participation of all residents and like uh, uh, the vice president put it before, to think about new models of how doing that. Because um, democracy is not a point of arrival, but a process which cities need to continually develop. And I think that is the reason I can, uh, why, why the European cabinet of democracy is so important, because it brings us together in thinking about these new models of uh, enabling democracy. And that's the reason why I am so proud to be part of this event. Thank you very much, Mr. City Councillor, for this impressive example uh, of uh, what innovative uh, examples we are trying to learn from with this initiative. Pan Primator Stenik Schrieb, Mayor of Lord Mayor of uh, Prague. Um, we are very proud to have all the Visegrad capitals uh, with us tonight in a round of uh, in a round of panels. Um, and recently, uh, you, the Visegrad capitals, uh, launched a pact of free cities, which has raised a lot of international interest. It's a commitment to the values of democracy, a commitment to the values we are trying to promote with our initiative. Uh, and it's interesting, I think, that this very strong signal from the Visegrad countries came from the cities. Um, so uh, I think you're especially well placed to, uh, to answer a question about this special role of cities in our current times. Well, thank you for that question.
question and thank you for inviting me to this uh, to this launch um, i see that the role of the cities is very very crucial because the cities are certainly the strongholds of democracy because by definition the local politics and local political representatives are very close to citizens and the, they are day-to-day -day problems uh, for instance if there is a broken sidewalk or some other defect in the municipal property it needs to be fixed immediately uh, and irrespectively to the particular political situation or affiliation of the politician or high level ideological paradigm so and it needs to be done properly cost effectively and as soon as possible so at the end of the day the mayors are the ones directly responsible for getting the job done and therefore there is practically no room for any populism uh, or authoritarian regime or anything like that in our job because the sidewalk needs to be fixed simply so as you mentioned the pact of free cities uh, we have uh, founded this very recently it's not just for the v4 capitals it's an open relationship to say so uh, anyone who shares our values uh, can join us and not just cities also other institution uh, also other institutions so the problem is However, that uh, quite uh, soon after we have uh, found the Pact of Free Cities, the entire world has been heavily hit by the coronavirus crisis. So uh, we have uh, we have focused on sharing the know-how, uh, how and best practices, how to deal with this uh, completely new situation, and uh, in fact, all the big cities actually stand at the forefront when it comes to dealing with the immediate consequences of these huge challenges and it's in fact it's not just the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, it's also the global climate change as well and in order to see for the cities to succeed in these multiple struggles they really need adequate funding and that's the reason why one of our main goals of the pact of the free cities is also to convince the european leaders that the direct funding of cities is uh, one of the possible antidotes against any potential uh, crisis in the foreseeable future to support the green innovations to put uh, to actually leave one of the extra levels the the, the national envelopes out of the of the of the chain would also bring the european union closer to the people and uh, i think this is a benefit for all the actors thank you very much Pan Primator. Um, this shows already that we were right about the link between the cities and european the european level uh, that uh, this is something that is very closely interrelated and this is something we want to discuss with our initiative as well. So thanks for this uh, observation. Um, now I would like to ask Alexander Dukievich, uh, the uh, mayor of Gdansk, uh, a city who had quite an important anniversary uh, this year to celebrate. Uh, since uh, you were uh, commemorating the 40 years of the Gdansk Declaration. Um, my question to you would, would be, uh, what does the fight in the city of Gdansk uh, for Solidarność, for the, for the right uh, to associate, um, mean for us today? The fight for liberty. Uh, hello, everyone, uh, Madam President, uh, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Jurgen Chernohorsky, uh, the leaders of the Innovation in Politics Institute. Thank you very much for this invitation to take part um, um, during this special event. I do hope that uh, one day we will meet all together in Vienna, uh, because I'm really looking forward to see all of you in person, but also to um, spend some time in Vienna. 
thank you very much for invitation to this event to my city, uh, city of Dansk, one of the crucial cities in Poland, though we are not a capital of Poland, as far as you, as you know, um, but we are fighting to be a capital of democracy. Uh, Gdansk is a very special city, city where 81 years ago, uh, on 1st of September 1939, Second World War began here in this city, on our land. But then again, 40 years ago, in the end of uh, August, uh, 31st of August, there were uh, August agreements signed here where communistic power uh, decided to sit in front of the uh, people who were on strike, not only simple workers, but also people of different sort of jobs, those who were fighting for democracy, independence, uh, freedom of speech. They decided to sit in front of them and sign the agreement. This is the city of Gdansk. And now, 40 years later, what we are doing here? First of all, democracy is, of course, very important. But then again, we have a questions, everyday questions. What does it mean uh, to be a democrat on every single day? Uh, of course, we are fighting, fighting for democracy in our every single local level where uh, we have um, local committees uh, among 35 of our districts in our city. Then again, last Tuesday, we had International Democracy Day. It's not always easy to gather people together uh, on a working day. Therefore, tomorrow, on Saturday, in a very central place of Dansk, uh, I asked people to come to celebrate democracy. I'm giving a floor to a people who are members of the, um, uh, of the city council, first of all, then youth city council, then senior city councils, to the elder uh, representation of our, of our uh, citizens, uh, but also, and I really do think that this is extremely important, not only for European cities, but also for the uh, European nations, but also for the European Union, to support uh, people from Belarus, to show that living without democracy is not really good or really convenient, and then living in a democratic country is good. Therefore, I also give a floor tomorrow to a uh, representative of the Belarusian minority, which is quite big in our city. Uh, we have something like two or three thousand people from Belarus living in Gdansk. Uh, what is more, several years ago, well, two years ago, uh, we adopted uh, as a city council um, policy uh, for equal, equal treatment of people in, uh, in Gdansk. Four years ago, we adopted a politician of integration of the immigrants in our city. Those are big documents, but step by step, we are trying to make our policy life in our city to more uh, to make more and more democracy but also to make more and more friendly to the people from no matter what they come from uh, well this is our um, everyday message to the people living here in Gdansk I do hope that we will one day receive this title of the European capital of democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's uh, very, very good to hear that you have uh, interest already in the title. Uh, we are hoping for a very good uh, competition. And with your city, I think you're raising the bar already. So that's very good news. Thank you very much.
Um, so thank you. I, I end this first round now. I hand over to Uta to ask whether there are questions uh, from the audience on this. Otherwise, I will uh, make a short short round. Thank you, Herfried, and thank you to all the wonderful statements that you gave, the inspiring statements and encouraging, especially. So now the floor is open for journalists to raise their hand or either ask a question in the private chat. To me, um, we have, I think, uh, three journalists present here, but also journalists present in the live stream. Uh, they are following us on YouTube. Uh, so is there a question? Please raise your hand. If you want to raise your hand, you have to go to participants on the right hand side on the bottom, then go into your name. And there you see the option that you can put your hand on, make it blue. Okay, I don't see a hand right now. Uh, either you don't find one. Oh, yes, I found one from uh, the Austrian radio station. Mr. Fortuber, you have a question. I will unmute you now. Please, Mr. Fortuber. I can't hear you. Maybe you type your question in the chat. So in the meantime, I think Herfried, it's, there is uh, some time for your question. And Mr. Fortuber has the chance to, to ask in the chat. I have a general question because it seems to me there is one element that connects all the interventions and that is maybe also connecting to uh, an observation that uh, that Pan Primator Schripp made that there is uh, no such thing as authoritarian tendencies on the city level. And it seems to me that this is uh, related to a principle that I would call reality bites. In a city, there you, you can not do that much propaganda. It's about delivery. Um, I'm just asking this question, whether this is to a certain extent also the secret of the strong force of, of, democratic, of, of democracy on the city level. And I'm asking this also to an experienced uh, former mayor, uh, the vice president, uh, who is now in a completely different role, obviously. Uh, may I refer to the words you said at the beginning, and it was, words can expire, but uh, actions can change the world. And this is the exact, the, uh, this is exact what mayors can do. It is executive power, if I may say so. And you have to reply to the, uh, you have to reply to the, uh, uh, to, to your citizens, what they ask from you, you have to deliver, as you said. Otherwise, uh, if you start talking and preaching, nothing, uh, nothing will change, and uh, you will not be in possibility to uh, uh, to run for next elections. So you always have to think about uh, these cycles. This is not, this is also very good because we have democratic elections, and since you have democratic elections, you always have to think next four years or next uh, six years, depending on the cycle, uh, are, uh, have you satisfied uh, uh, the ideas and uh, the, the replies from your citizens? And I was uh, from Prague uh, who said that uh, there's no room for any public, no room for any authoritarian, you had to, uh, to deliver. And this is uh, uh, what you did, uh, what you do when you are mayor, otherwise, uh, uh, and as I said, politics, politics, regardless of the difference of my role nowadays, but as I said, politics is not any more business as usual, and democracy couldn't be taken for granted. So we have to build democracy, we have to develop democracy, and this is uh, all of us, regardless of the level on which uh, we serve at the moment. Thank you very much, Madam Vice President. Um, is there a question from the side of the journalists they would like to ask? It's now your chance 
to raise a question, to ask a question to these wonderful distinguished guests. Okay. Either it's the, it's the technique, the, digi the digital challenges we face every day, or, uh, yeah, your statements were so wonderful that no one has a question. Is there a question maybe from the participants side, from the speaker's side, you want to ask to someone else now here in the panel? If I may just raise one yeah, topic. Wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Uta. Um, I really don't know the answer to this uh, question, which is really quite complicated. We already uh, were together with uh, Ms. Um, Ms. Toika, Ms. Um, Adam, Vice President. Uh, I'm not quite sure in which of the uh, very important bodies around European Union we took already um, part in a discussion on uh, democracy and human rights. Um, but um, this is something where I really wake up every single morning, uh, raising up in my head a question, what more we can do on our local level so it is maybe a question more to Jürgen or Zdenek. What more we can really do to um, save the democracy or to develop the democracy uh, on our local level, but also uh, at our national levels? Um, as far as really obvious what I'm going to say, as far as we can see the democracy, it, well, in many spaces, many surroundings, we can see this big question mark if the democracy is really the, the only way we could govern our local communities or our countries or the European Union. Therefore, this is something what I really would like to share with you, maybe to find a solution or to give a tips to, to each other, what more we can do to support democracy on our local, national, and European levels. Thank you. If I may reiterate uh, what I already said, <laughs> I think, uh, as I said, uh, citizens' participation is very important. Okay, you have to, uh, if I may try to answer your question. <laughs> Uh, you you uh, you have to include citizens at each and every level, and maybe citizens have answers uh, to your problems. So this is the reason reason why we are activating this uh, new exercise, which is called Conference on the Future of Europe. We want to talk about future of Europe, but it's not Europe in, uh, on on the level of European Commission, European Council, and European Parliament. Europe is everywhere, in each and every corner of Europe, in each and every village in Poland, in each and every village in the uh, Czech Republic. So, we, uh, uh, so each and every mayor or city councillor, uh, if, if you will be able to uh, reach uh, each and every citizen, regardless of their affiliation, as you uh, previously said, and then they can maybe say what are their problems, what are their concerns, what are their hopes, what are their expectations from you as mayor or us as uh, being a politician at this level. So they can help us develop democracy and this is the reason why we think that we we are uh, obliged to give citizens a greater say. This is, uh, this is not only words and the theory, this is, uh, this is the truth. Because we saw even now, in the midst of this uh, COVID-19 crisis, that people uh, are looking uh, for solutions and they want us to answer their questions, which are not easy to answer. If I, answer, if I may say, you know, there there are really big problems, especially in the in the field of health. But still, I think they uh, they should be involved, and then you can share the burden with citizens if I may say so, and they can help you in solving everyday problems. 
May I say a few words to support the, the intervention, intervention of, of the Vice President? Um, you heard it before, there is an election uh, taking place in Vienna in a few weeks. But um, I think, as we all tried to put it in the last uh, um, hour, um, I, I deeply believe that democracy is so much more than organizing elections every four or five or six years, whatever. Democracy is about actively getting people involved, not only participation in a maybe old style way of asking them, but actively getting them involved. And maybe it's also the link to the question Helfried asked before about uh, right-wing populism and author authoritarian uh, um, um, situations. I think uh, as mayors, as, as, uh, as people responsible in, in cities, we know what our main objective is. It is getting the work done. And it's not possible to just talk about problems and making them bigger and finding someone to blame. You have to get the work done. And in order to get the work done, uh, you have to ask those uh, who, are the, the, who, are, who have the most expertise on the district uh, problems, on the problems on the, in, in the streets, and the problems in, in, in different communities in our cities. And these people, the experts, are the residents of the cities. So it's all about finding new ways of actively empowering and um, asking people to make politics together with us. Thank you. Uh, may, I, may I just ask uh, uh, Pan Primator if you would like to have a final word because we're basically at the end of our time. Um, like to share yes. Well, well, Alexandra had uh, asked the question that actually I wanted to ask. So now I'm in a position that I had to answer it, which is not, <laughs> which is not a comfortable position because it's a very hard question. Well, from my position, what can we do to support the democracy um, on our level and also on the national level? Is uh, for me, I see. Uh, one very important way, and that is to provide a real solution to the problems of the real people, which will prevent the populists that are always lurking just around the corner to bring their possible solutions, which are very simple, nice sounding and definitely wrong solutions. And uh, this is the national level is much more has much more tendency uh to this kind of things because uh, uh, on the municipal level uh, it is quite easy to see behind the propaganda and uh, but on the national level it is much more about the marketing and pr thing so maybe this is the way how we should uh, explain our citizens that this is the right way to assess the ability of a politician to work for them. It's not about the PR, it's about the real job done. And that's, that's how they should look at the people who are trying to tell them the nice things. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pan Primator. And, uh... Thank you very much to all the panelists uh, for this wonderful and very interesting and uh, uh, interventions. I can only thank you by telling you that there is a gift underway for you, which is uh, this booklet, uh, which we uh, prepared for the launch tonight. And uh, you will find this in your mail in the next couple of uh, days. Um, and I hope uh, you will like it because there is a lot of best practice in this book already. Um, and uh, I think we have seen in this very first panel already that there is a lot of best practice to be exchanged. And uh, there is a very positive spirit uh, in terms of finding solutions together. And this is exactly what we try uh, with our European Capital of Democracy initiative. And I'm extremely thankful to all of you for your uh, support for this initiative, which uh, will hopefully uh, start like a rocket uh, when it is being launched uh, uh, today. Thank you. Thank you.
second round of our press round tables. It's a great pleasure and honor to welcome you all, the distinguished guests of the uh, round table now, and of course the leading journalists from all over Europe who also joined the session, as I can see. And we also welcome those who follow us on the live stream, the journalists who follow us on the live stream and also the audience. My name is Uta, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the Innovation and Politics Institute, and I will be moderating this session. Thank you all so much for being here also this Friday uh, early evening. Uh, I, I know it's not uh, for granted, and uh, as you all know, uh, originally we had planned the event in the Vienna City Hall, uh, which would have taken place uh, right now, but due to Corona, to, due to the corona pandemic, of course, we cannot take to it and we took it to the digital sphere. So uh, we are very glad and proud that our initiative has found this great interest and support of all of you. And um, so allow me to first introduce all the guest speakers. Today we have with us uh, Mr. Rafał Czaskowski, the mayor of Warsaw in Poland. Welcome. Hello, good evening. So, Mr. Kostas Bakoyanis, the mayor of the beautiful city of Athens in Greece. And Mr. Amano sanchez Rivo, the deputy mayor of, for European Affairs in Paris and France, uh, in France. Bonsoir. Bonsoir à tous. <laughs> good evening. This session will be hosted by Mr. Helfried Karl, who is the managing partner of the Innovation and Politics Institute. And he's also the co-founder of the European Capital of Democracy initiative that we are launching right now. Finally, a short technical notice, uh, especially for the journalists. Uh, if you would like to uh, uh, raise a question. Uh, first of all, we will have a few statements from the participants, from the speakers, and then afterwards the journalists will have the chance to raise their hands. And I will shortly explain how you can do it. You go on the right hand side to the bottom, uh, push on participants, then you can see your name. And if you go uh, on your name, you can see that you can uh, put your hand on. And please turn it off if you have already asked your question. And uh, if you would like, if you don't want to raise, uh, if you don't want to ask your question live, you can also write it to me in the private chat if you go on the speech bubble uh, on my picture. So now I will hand over to Helfried Karl to introduce the whole initiative. Please, Helfried. Thank you very much, Uta, and uh, thank you very much to uh, the mayors joining us in this panel. Uh, I think we are putting a quite uh, strong uh, show of force uh, here tonight uh, because uh, uh, this is a very high-powered panel. Uh, it was preceded by a very high-powered panel, and there will be another very high-powered panel. So there is lots of power um, here. And I am very honored to represent the European Capital of Democracy Initiative. Um, the initiative started about one and a half years ago, when we in the European, in the Innovation and Politics Institute, um, thought we want to create a positive discourse on democracy in Europe. And we were wondering how we can show all the real life experiments that are taking place every day in Europe by local governments of the people, by the people, and for the people. And how we could ensure that others get inspired and follow suit. Because our analysis is that we don't hear enough about the many innovative forms of democracy that are being practiced in cities all over Europe. Instead, we hear about authoritarian strongmen and their lies, that they represent the people and that, they, that the democracy is a weak idea that is slowly to be replaced by some kind of new authoritarianism. And we believe that this is giving us wrong impression that they are winning. Many people 
are losing hope in democracy. They do believe in human rights and democracy, and they want to preserve the, the planet. But they are swamped with bad news from all over the world about all the things that do not work. I believe and I'm convinced that hope can be a very powerful political resource. If hope is taken away from us, we tend to be less courageous and less creative. In the end, this leads to political cynicism or worse. So we in the Innovation Politics Institute decided to change the momentum to talk about what works in our democracies. We want to put the limelight on those constructive forces who deserve it and create a kind of a beauty contest of democratic best practice with the annual selection of an European capital of democracy. How will this work? In order to become a European capital of democracy, cities will have to apply with a curated program of what they concretely intend to innovate in their democratic practice and for their citizens. A jury of experts will help us evaluate their bid and make a short list of five cities. These five cities will be taken to a representative online jury of 10,000 European citizens from the 47 member states of the Council of Europe. And this 10,000 head jury will decide the winner. The European capital of democracy of any given year will then not only implement its own democracy program with its citizens. There will be more. It will serve as a stage for the European discourse on democracy in general. It will organize expert panels, political fairs, art festivals, all of them dealing with democracy, and all of this will take place in the city. Also, the European Youth Parliament will meet there, thanks to the Schwarzkopf Foundation. And we know that many will follow with the specific tracks we are organizing. We will have a track dealing with the challenges and opportunities posed for democracy in the digital age. We will have a track dealing with the climate crisis and democracy. We will have a track dealing with education and one with participation. All this we will organize together with third partners. Partners who believe as we do in the European Convention on Human Rights and who believe as we do that the time has come to act. Because words can inspire, but actions change the world and we need action. So next spring, we will publish a call asking all European citizens to compete for this honorary title. Cities will have one year time to complete their bids so that our group of experts can assess the applications and submit a shortlist to the citizens jury. In August 2022, the European citizens will be asked to vote. And on 15 September, which is a dedicated International Day of Democracy, in 2022, the first elected European capital of democracy will be announced. Its program will start one year later because there is some time that needed to prepare on 15 September 2023. In the meantime, we will work with two partner cities who volunteer as European capitals of democracy in 2021 and 2022. These first two cities will demonstrate how strong our concept is and what can be done during a year of holding this wonderful title. The decision on the pilot capitals will be taken based on the content of their program and in conjunction with our experts. Who these pilot cities will be, this is going to be decided. We will keep you informed in the coming months, but I can assure you that there is already a lot of interest. Thank you very much. This was just to serve to explain the uh, content of the initiative. And I would like now uh, uh, to go to the distinguished panelists um, and start uh, with uh, the mayor of Warsaw, Mr. Rafa Truszaskowski, um, and tell the audience also that we are very honored that he is one uh, of the four uh, Visegrad capital mayors who are joining us tonight um, and uh, that these uh, Visegrad four capitals are um, a very a very important group because they launched a pact of free cities just recently 
um, which has raised a lot of international interest. And it's a commitment, this pact, to the values of democracy and liberty. Um, so from the outside, it was quite interesting to see, to see that these cities have uh, become organized in this way. And my question to you, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, is what do you think is the special role of the cities in protecting and innovating democracy? Well, good evening to you all. Uh, bonsoir, Emmanuel. Je suis très joyeux de te voir. Uh, Costas, hello. Calispera. Uh, I'm very honored to, for, to, to be here, you know, during this panel and have an opportunity to talk about democracy in the cities. And uh, it is a great initiative uh, made by the uh, Innovation uh, uh, Institute in, in Vienna. So thank you very much for the invitation. I mean, the, the times are difficult, so we would uh, probably we would have been a bit more uh, happy to see each other in person in Vienna, but but uh, let's do it as we can uh, through uh, the uh, immense opportunities of the internet. Well, I mean, it is true that, you know, there is an onslaught of populism all around Europe, and this is not just a phenomenon that is known to Poland or Hungary or or Turkey, but uh, we have populism all around in, in, in most of our countries, and obviously we're battling with it, uh, trying to strengthen uh, our democracy. And the crisis uh, that we observe of uh, the of democracy in Europe, uh, we can see it almost on every turn, you know, with Brexit, with uh, economic crisis, with uh, the attitude of quite a few governments to difficult problems such as uh, refugees. Uh, in Poland, it is uh, uh, specifically very important because, you know, we were very proud of, of the past and we're still very proud of the past 30 years. We were just celebrating 40 years of solidarity movements of, of, of the uh, trade unions that uh, brought us freedom and brought us uh, from the cold. Uh, but obviously the situation in Poland is quite difficult so with uh, the conservative government, which is breaking the rule of law and uh, which is making our uh, life uh, quite uh, difficult. The important thing is that cities are at the forefront of change and, and most of the issues that used to be the domain of uh, national politics touch uh, our life and touch uh, you know, our prerogatives and the decisions are, are taken now on the city level or on the regional level. I mean, wherever you, you, you look, I mean, if you look at uh, the problem of the uh, financial crisis and everything which happens with COVID and after COVID, uh, it leads to, to an incredible transformation of the way in which cities are functioning and in which the cities are going to function in the future. If we talk about climate change, which is one of the greatest um, challenges that are before us, again, the cities are at the forefront and, and have to deal with it. So wherever you look, uh, a great burden is put on uh, our shoulders. The difference is this, that we are very close to the citizens. And in a sense, uh, we are a bulwark against populism because we need to take decisions on the spot. We need to take decisions uh, in uh, uh, collaboration with uh, the citizens who elected us and whom we meet every day on the streets of our cities. Uh, so this contact is much closer, but obviously we are doing everything that we can in order to strengthen that contact. And I think that we have, for example, in Warsaw, we have participatory budgets. I think that this is, uh, this is true uh, about uh, most of the cities in Europe where we uh, try to divide a part of the budget uh, with uh, the people according to their wishes. Uh, we have just announced uh, an uh, environmental citizens panel where uh, the citizens of Warsaw will give us directions when it comes to fi fi fighting climate change, and we, were, uh, we are obviously ready to put them uh, in practice. And we are fighting, uh, all of us, for our cities to remain open, to remain transparent, uh, to remain European, which is very important uh, in the context of uh, today's uh, Europe and, uh, for example, Sadiq Khan is exactly on the same page with us, even though uh, Great Britain is leaving uh, leaving the European Union. Uh, but most importantly, uh, we want our cities to be uh, tolerant and looking into the future. And sometimes it's not in sync 100% with the governments. So finally, what I wanted to tell you is that we need to be ready for the future because. COVID, which puts a great strain on our budgets, which puts a great strain on the way in which cities are managed, also changes the reality. We need a new solidarity that is going to respond to some of those challenges. And we need to work together in order to establish the right benchmarks and work together in order to meet most of those challenges in difficult times where sometimes the governments 
make our life difficult. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, or uh, should I say the leader of the Polish opposition at the same time? So uh, you are in, in two roles, uh, I think. Uh, but uh, it was extremely important also to, to hear this. And I think uh, this is very much um, echoes what we have heard in the former panel also, um, uh, that uh, the, the secret of the cities is that they are very close to the, to the citizens. Um, I will get back to this maybe later. But uh, before, I would like to give the floor uh, to Mr. Kostas Bakoyanis, uh, the mayor of Athens. Um, Mr. Mayor, when it comes to Athens, it seems not too difficult uh, to find a link to democracy, does it? Um, but uh, with your 2,500 years of experience in this, um, I think uh, the question to you uh, should be even more forward-looking. What will be the role of cities to defend uh, our European values? Well, greetings from the birthplace of democracy. It's wonderful to be here with you and my congratulations for the initiative. Now, let's be as frank and as open as we can. We are not here because we want to engage in a vanity exercise. I think none of us is here for this reason. None of us is here because we want to do political PR. We are here because I think we all share a concern about where democracy is heading. And we are sharing this concern exactly because the democracy these days is facing challenges and is even facing, I would go that far, threats. Uh, challenges that may even be existential because we see that the forces, the dark forces of uh, populism, of autocracy, of nativism, of populism have been raising their heads uh, throughout Europe, but also around the world. Um, Greece has had a very tough uh, 10 years. And Athens was actually at the epicenter of this financial unprecedented crisis. I mean, the best way, the probably one way to describe it would be to say that no other country uh, in peacetime has seen such a rapid decline in its GDP in the history of modern economics. And yes, there were times, uh, especially a few years ago, when uh, there was a lot of talk about Greece resembling the Weimar Republic. Um, there was uh, there was incredible economic and social inequality. There was unemployment. There was instability. There was even violence in our streets. However, uh, thanks to the resilience of the Athenians, uh, thanks to this very, to democratic values being really deeply ingrained in our DNA, we have actually emerged from this crisis uh, stronger than ever. We have isolated uh, all, all um, extremists. We have defeated populism. Our democratic institutions are uh, stronger than ever. Um, and now we look at the future with a newly found sense of optimism, uh, dynamism. So I think there is a lesson to be learned here. And I think that the role of local government of cities is extremely important. As uh, the mayor of Warsaw, my colleague, said earlier, yes, we are the closest to the citizen, but that means that we have the, we're the most accountable. Uh, we, that means that we have to take, uh, make the, be the biggest effort to safeguard transparency. That means that at the end of the day, it's not about words, it's about deeds. Uh, it's about working bottom up and building cross uh, party and even cross ideological um, alliances, broad alliances, that bring people together, that actually unify. Now, this is, of course, we all know it, uh, far from obvious. Uh, we all know, we know that it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, but it's worthwhile. And uh, cities, by definition, are the, nat the, the natural change agents of a society. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting observations um, again hoping that a secret seems to be that uh, you can always be sure that uh, if you make an effort in a city you can have the kind of dialogue uh, you need to have feedback that democracy uh, a, a, a lively democracy needs 
Um, so uh, I'm handing over now the panel to uh, Monsieur Sanchez Ruivo, who is uh, the Deputy Mayor of European Affairs uh, in Paris. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Um, Mr. Deputy Mayor, Paris uh, is ahead of Vienna because it already held elections this year. And uh, so congratulations on your mandate. Thank you. We have heard a lot, a lot in the international media even about participative budgeting in, in Paris. Um, can you tell us about your experience in giving more power to the citizens? Is that one of the uh, secrets of, of the success in the, in the recent electoral uh, campaign? Sure, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the, the invitation. It's always a pleasure to uh, to speak after Rafael and Costas because they, they said everything. And not just because of saying that they said everything. Uh, it's just a, a way of saying that we have all the same experience, quite all the same experience. And it is very important to make our citizens realize that what is happening in Paris is happening in Paris, so it's happening in Athens, it's happening in a lot of capitals. So we can have the, the same solutions because some uh, of the times we have the same the same problems. Um, that's why it's so important also uh, to have uh, those uh, European uh, capitals of democracy and uh, also uh, why it's really important to have our networks like Eurocity, for example, um, because we have to share experience, we have to know each other, we have to, to go through the elections, of course, but uh, when I think about uh, um, Vienna now, you have election, and then we have quite four years to work together. I mean, clean, because uh, uh, we have some, so, so many things uh, to do. Um, and my special congratulations to, uh, to Mayor uh, Michael Ludwig uh, for, uh, for all the initiative and especially for this one too. Very proud of uh, Vienna. Talking about, uh, about Paris and about the citizenship, about the, the, um, the questions of democracy, we cannot take democracy for granted. Uh, it's a fight. Uh, every day we have to fight for it. It's a privilege, but it's also something that we have um, to be, uh, uh, especially on, the, on those days, on uh, what we're living, not because only of COVID, because of populism. We have to be very, very, uh, taking very care of, uh, of democracy. One way of doing this is uh, giving uh, the floor to uh, our citizens. When we decide, when Anne Hidalgo in 2014 uh, decided to give 500 million euros for the, the, the five years of uh, um, activities uh, to the participatory budget, we are saying, as uh, Rafael said uh, already, um, you have the solutions, you know uh, your districts, you know your streets, you know what uh, is really important. So help us to do the best uh, for uh, for the city. So we had uh, the chance and uh, the capacity of uh, having the budget and uh, we did a lot of work. We are increasing this uh, participating uh, budget to quite a billion for the next five uh, years. It is important to do so. And we know that with the crisis that uh, is ahead of us, uh, will not be that easy, but it is important because people are now used to uh, have this participative budget to say what is important and to be part of uh, the um, of the solution. Um, but talking about democracy is always having uh, the question about the, the younger. Uh, that's why we also have a special link to uh, what is happening on our schools. We're uh, fighting for people um, with 16 years old uh, to participate on the next uh, uh, polls, to have the possibility to say what, what they have on their mind at 16, not only at eight, uh, 18, because they are not the future, they are already the, the, um, the present. That's another, another part. Of course, having uh, uh, realized that the, the name of Paris, uh, because of the history, it's always 
easy to do the link with the 1789 and the French Revolution. But still, Paris and has this capacity, this capacity to, uh, for example, uh, giving the honorary citizenship. And we know that it can help people that are persecuted. Um, we know that it's something that can be um, a way of having a lot of people moving. So that's why we have to, uh, to do this. We are preparing a house uh, to receive the mayors that are persecuted in some parts of this uh, world. Because we cannot imagine that the future will be without the cities. The cities are the center. Um, and uh, my, my colleagues say, so we are the local. We are the nearest part of, uh, uh, of democracy, of uh, um, this participation with, the, with democracy. So, so that, that's why it's, it's also important not to having um, those uh, action in our cities, but always to do the link with the others. The nearest one, and the nearest one for us is not only the French uh, um, cities, but also the other European cities. Um, and maybe uh, a last thing that I would like to, uh, to say. Um, when, when we heard about uh, um, what was I mean, terrible uh, acting in Belarus, we were deeply concerned about it, but we have no link, no special link with Minsk. So we were very uh, uh, proud on uh, helping in our way um, the cities that had this link to Minsk, and especially thinking about um, Verso and uh, uh, all the action that were held. If we can help, we will help. That's a part of democracy, not only within our cities, but also in the link with the, uh, the other cities. Uh, thank you very much for this truly European uh, statement. Uh, Belarus is very much on our mind uh, also because uh, the initiative, as we describe it, is an initiative that will take place on the territory of the Council of Europe, the 47 member states of the Council of Europe. So uh, we very much hope that uh, the 48th member state of the Council of Europe will soon become uh, the, the state of Belarus. Uh, but obviously there are conditions to be met and uh, we are very much looking at the developments there. Uh, with, but also, uh, we are also concerned uh, about uh, the situation. And uh, obviously, uh, the, the, the Polish friends are very close by. Uh, we had heard this in the, in the panel before as well, uh, how important and how close they are following these, uh, these developments. But uh, without further ado, um, I would like to hand over now to Uta to moderate the questions uh, that she has received in the meantime from the audience. Yes, indeed. Um, I received a bunch of questions, which shows that they are also concerned about the state of democracy. And the first question uh, is to the mayor of Warsaw. Uh, if Warsaw, for example, would be the next European capital of democracy, what would that mean for your region? Well, I mean, the important thing is obviously uh, the symbolism of it all, because uh, th that's why we've uh, signed the pact of four uh, free cities uh, in our parts of Europe, the Visegrad Group, uh, Budapest, um, uh, Bratislava, Prague and, and Warsaw, which then is enlarged because we work on common initiatives with quite a few different cities. For example, we are fighting for direct access to EU funds, and our in initiative was supported by, uh, by a very large number of cities in Europe. So it is important to show that even if uh, governments are difficult, even the, if the governments are trampling on the rule of law, uh, the cities uh, still uphold democratic values and still want to remain open and tolerant. I mean, in case of Poland, uh, out of 111 cities, 100 big and small, medium-sized cities, 107 are held by mayors uh, of the uh, uh, of the opposition or, or independent. And for example, throughout my presidential campaign for the Republic, I mean, most of the mayors stood next to me in order to show that uh, the the the, uh, the values of democracy, of open cities, of European cities are close to us all. And these were mayors from very different political backgrounds. They were not only from my party, but they were 
independence. They were from the left. They were uh, they were uh, the ones who sometimes even used to cooperate with the uh, with the Conservative Party. So this is very important, obviously, for symbolic reasons, but also because we could uh, do uh, an important benchmark in exchange. Um, a lot of experiences, how we can make our cities more democratic, what tools to use, which are going to increase uh, participation of our citizens uh, who, are all, who are never, never happy with what we do, because I mean, that's 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 the nature of local politics. Uh, our citizens, the citizens of what wants to have even more say in what's happening in, in, in the city. So uh, the more experiences we can actually exchange uh, and talk about the tools that we use in different cities and which are effective, which are not. Uh, I mean, for example, in the in the era of the social media, sometimes certain tools which uh, looked very promising then turned to be counterproductive. So I think that this sort of exchange um, uh, when cities are going to prepare programs can really benefit uh, us and can actually translate the slogans and the symbols into reality on the ground. Thank you very much. Uh, you spoke about the tools and actually the next question is about these kind of tools that we need to improve democracy. And uh, one one audience member uh, would like to ask this question to uh, Mayor Vakoyanis. Uh, and, and he was asking, uh, what can we learn from the democratic past uh, of ancient Greece to address the existential challenges that you mentioned in your statement? I will unmute you. This question. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'm not sure I'm the most appropriate person to answer this question, uh, given that, you know, us mayors tend to be much more practical. But I think there is one key lesson that's very, very important to all of us, which is that democracy is actually fragile, yeah, that democracy cannot be taken for granted. And we know that very well. It's a lesson from history. Um, in Athens right now, as we speak, we have a number of tools uh, that we have utilized um, to make sure that all citizens participate. Uh, we have programs like um, Adopt Your City. We have Athens Partnership. We are actually in the process of implementing a huge uh, transformation of the center of Athens and we do that uh, through citizen participation. But if you ask me uh, in this one year and 20 days of being mayor, what was actually the most emotional moment was when uh, we, uh, we, we have an annual democracy award. And uh, last year, we gave this award to the family of Pavel Adamovich. Um, that was uh, really moving for many of us. Uh, because at the end of this day, um, there are those ideals uh, that bring us all together. These are ideas that transcend borders. Uh, these are ideas that even transcend ideologies. You know, you may belong to the left, you may belong to the right, but we still agree on an overreaching um, um, ideal. Uh, and it, it is it is very important thing that we all come together in celebrating um, our principles. Thanks so much for this uh, for this input. Um, there is actually another question that addresses Mr. Deputy Mayor Rivo, and uh, I think it connects perfectly to to the project of uh, participatory budgeting in your city. Uh, so, talking about the youth, talking about the young generation, how can they better be connected to politics, which sometimes is not a very tangible uh, sphere and sometimes there is distrust and trust um, towards politics and the idea of democracy so can you can you tell us can you give us a picture maybe your project helped uh, involving young people uh, more often um, that's a fact that we have uh, um, to uh, make people realize that there's a lot of politicians. We have deputies, we have senators, we have a lot of people working, for example, the government. But those who are doing the politics um, near um, the public is the city. So 
we're trying to, to make uh, uh, people understand that we are mm, much more in a, in a cooperation than just you know being elected and then uh, doing uh, our our job. Um, one thing that happened in Paris, uh, but only 15 years ago, um, we have uh, 20 districts and we decide to cut each one of these districts in four or five or uh, six more smaller districts. Um, first. Second, we decide to give back money to those districts to have their own budget for some actions, special actions, but uh, those actions uh, had to be decided by the inhabitants. Of course, we had to do the legality, make sure that it was possible to do uh, the, the, the job or the work that they're asking us to do. But the thing is, um, within these last 15, 20 years, we, we had uh, the, the goal of uh, having much more people in a day-to-day -day basis work about their neighbor, their neighborhood. Um, First, uh, the, the third thing uh, I would like to, to, uh, to say, when we talk about the, the participatory budget, um, we decided to give part of the money to uh, only uh, projects of the neighborhood, but also a part of the budget um, that uh, was going to be uh, elected for the old Parisian uh, uh, territory. So you decide for one project for your neighbor uh, and one project for the old city. And that was a, a, a way of making them realize that it's not only a question of what's happening nearby, but also having a plan of the whole, uh, the whole city. I'm talking about this because uh, we had something like 100 uh, um, uh, projects, uh, big projects at the first year. And now we have something like 3,000 projects. At that time. So there are much more people saying, okay, it's a good idea. And it's not only uh, exhibition. I mean, it's not only, you know, for, for, for uh, being uh, uh, cool. And it's really something uh, important to, uh, to be in, to participate. Um, that's why the, the, the participatory budget was uh, uh, that important. And of course, we realized that some of the projects that we had to do, we, we had to, 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 to change district or, or, um, or this school, but we did it uh, because the inhabitants asked for it. And we did uh, before what we had planned uh, first, because they said it is really important to have it now and this way. Um, I think I'm hoping that I'm answering to, to this question. And there's another thing that I would like to say, just uh, um, a few words. Um, we also launched this uh, uh, citizenship card, um, and we realized that we have now 250,000 people with this card uh, saying, I'm a citizen of Paris, and that 50% of these uh, um, people are people under 16 years old. And why is it so important for them? Because this card also allows to go uh, in parts of, of Paris and to, to be part of some conference. I mean, they just realized, and it was a project made by the participatory budget. This, this card was also a project of the participatory uh, budget. Thanks a lot. Yes. That was actually also my question, like how does it affect young, the younger generation and are there projects implemented for younger people? So the last thing um, that, that comes in from, from the live stream chat, and then I will hand over to Herfried, is more or less a comment uh, and not a question. And um, the, it says the clear commitment to democracy and diversity is pleasantly to hear. I agree, especially from such important capital cities, and they are acting as role models, showing people sometimes better than what populism is. Maybe some of you wants to um, give a statement on this, or maybe have it. Maybe I can make one observation, um, and uh, that is that I am convinced that the 
obviously it is easier for cities to organize a uh, kind of citizen participation in a meaningful way for citizens than it is on a national level uh, because the choices are very often clearer. Uh, I think there is less uh, less room for propaganda uh, on a in, on a city level, and it is very clear that you have to decide on very practical on very practical things. But at the same time, I think this is extremely an important mechanism to empower citizens and to give them the experience uh, that you can change things. Because I believe that the the vitriol in our society is the citizens, a citizen who thinks he or she cannot influ influence uh, uh, the, the society anymore, that, uh, that democracy is just a facade. Whatever you are doing, you are not able to change uh, the, fate of, the fate of society. And I think that this link that citizens, that city, cities can organize probably better or easier than you can do on the national level, that's a very powerful tool. And I think the more we work on this, uh, the more our citizens will also get uh, this kind of experience. And I think this is an empowering experience. Even if you lose a vote or if you lose a cause in a participatory budgeting exercise, it means that there was a meaningful discourse about it and you know or you get to you get the experience that things had to be negotiated and that there is some compromise because compromise is also a very important concept for democracy uh, which lately i think is is not very popular sometimes uh, but i think it's important to see it and in in in, in practical city politics probably you need this uh, a lot but i'm talking to people who have much more experience on this than i do yeah, well, if I, if I may, uh, I mean, populism is everywhere, and of course, propaganda is everywhere. I can attest to it because I'm the enemy number one of the kind conservative government. So uh, I think that every day uh, the public TV, which turns into a, a, a party TV, is producing at least 10 different uh, manipulations about myself. So, I mean, of course, there is propaganda even on the city level because now I'm being attacked uh, about the city. But uh, we are in a very, um, uh, very uh, um, positive scenario, uh, in a sense, w w as mayors of the city, because it is not that easy uh, to uh, to change the opinion of the of the of the inhabitants of our cities about us, because this is the beauty of being uh, in local politics, and this is the beauty of being mayor that actually your decisions really have an impact on citizens' life immediately. So even if there is a lot of propaganda, I mean, whatever happens on the news, it is much easier to test it it's you know the results of our actions are much more palpable so simply the uh, the inhabitants of our cities know better you know what what is the truth because they, they simply see uh, the effects of our decision making on the streets uh, but uh, since now i would submit to you that this division between local politics regional politics and national politics it is it's much less clear uh, then this is why it is so important to exchange uh, our uh, our experiences and to think about what to do in the future when it comes to battling populism. Why is this line uh, less clear? Uh, I think that simply the challenges that uh, that national governments are now tackling uh, cannot be met without the cooperation with uh, the local uh, governments. We are not. Uh, anymore just concentrating on on local initiative building roads infrastructure and so on and so forth but we have to tackle the uh, the uh, challenges that are before the european union as such head on i mean take the example of covid you know i'm responsible for, for 10 hospitals for public uh, transportation for schools so obviously you know we are at the at, at the forefront of fight with covid and the government is taking some of the most important decisions, but at the end of the day, we are responsible for the security of the kids at schools. We are responsible um, for the local hospitals, which take the biggest brunt of, of, of COVID. Uh, and at the end of the day, this link or the, the boundary between national politics and local politics becomes very much blurred. Therefore, your initiative uh, is very worthwhile because I think that there is um, uh, not only uh, an opportunity, but an, an existential need uh, for us to actually coordinate our actions, to learn from one another in order to, uh, to have the best recipe on how to um, tackle those issues 
uh, when there is an onslaught of, of populist propaganda all around us and where we are sometimes the most reviled uh, persons of uh, national politics uh, because, um, because we are popular in our cities and because we know that there is no other way but to make our cities and our countries more open, more tolerant, more European, uh, and of course, uh, protecting um, you know, the citizens' rights and, uh, and following the rule of law. Mr. Weaver wants to add something. Let me just to it. say something. Um, uh, with we'll the election uh, in, in June, uh, we are 160 councillors, uh, 63 councillors in Paris. We have not one councillor of the extreme uh, right wing. Um, those that are asking, uh, you know, like French first. Uh, why? What, what is my explanation? Because the city decided to give solidarity um, in budget, because we we had the, the the work of explaining everybody that we are working for everybody and everybody has his place in in, in Paris. We had the, the, the work to explain uh, what the, is uh, the common sense of living uh, together, um, and um, they could not say uh, those are helped. And we are not help uh, the Parisians or the Frenchmen, for example. Just to say that the cities have this um, uh, capacity, uh, and sometimes they do it uh, when the national government don't have same priority. Um, that's why it's so important uh, to fight populism, because within the, the, the solidarity, within the education, Within the, our programs, we can uh, solve quite all the problems. Um, and that's why we have to still be on this matter. Um, uh, again, populism for education, because we want to live um, in a peaceful uh, uh, city, uh, in a peaceful country where everybody can live uh, together. That's why it's also so important to have the example of the other cities that are also uh, fighting for the same thing. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Mayor. We, I think we have to come to an end. I don't know whether Mayor Bakoyanis would like to have the final word. Uh, please. You're on mute, please. This was a, fight, a fascinating and enlightening discussion. We'd like to thank you so much for bringing us together. Uh, I think we need much more than this. Uh, we need much more engagement with each other. Uh, we need much more um, exchanging ideas and thoughts. Uh, clearly, uh, everything that unites us is much more than what divides us. So once again, my thanks, and I hope that this will continue with the same pace in the months and years to come. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you to all the panelists for participating. Um, Thank you I very much. Just tell you that uh, if you had come to Vienna, we would have given you this book. Uh, so we are going to send it to you. There is a lot of back practice, best practice involved already. Some of your cities also. Uh, thank you very much for contributing. And we are very, very happy to have you as our supporters. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of you. Au revoir. Au revoir. Have a nice evening.
Anu? It's a great pleasure and honor to welcome our distinguished guests today and also the journalists who are joining us uh, on this platform and also on the live stream and also the audience that is listening to us uh, on the YouTube live stream. So welcome to everyone. And thank you all so much to, to be with us this Friday evening. Actually, we are already celebrating the opening of the European Capital of Democracy initiative since 5 p.m., uh, since this is our third uh, press roundtable. And originally, we wanted to do uh, the launch event in Vienna City Hall this evening, uh, but unfortunately, as you all know, we couldn't do it due to the COVID crisis and had to take it to the digital sphere. And we're glad and proud that this whole initiative has found so much interest and support from, from both of you and from the, from the other audience and, and journalists who join us. And now allow me to introduce the, the round of speakers, um, which is first of all, uh, the mayor of Bratislava in Slovakia, Mr. Matos Valo. Good evening. And second, uh, Lord Mayor of Budapest, Budapest in Hungary, Mr. Gege Korasonje. Good evening. To all who are listening to our panel today, uh, just a short explanation. Mr. Korasonje will have an interpreter. He will start talking uh, for a few seconds and then the interpreter will be heard uh, via audio so that all of you know that this, his statement will be translated. Who's the managing partner of the Innovation and Politics uh, Institute and one of the co-founders of the European Capital of Democracy Initiative. And finally, a short technical note uh, for those uh, journalists who join us. Uh, if you want to, if you would like to talk, uh, or if you would like to uh, raise a question, you can do so in a private chat to me. If you go on my picture and go to the speech bubble, uh, you can ask me a question or you can just raise your hand by going on your name in the participant list and uh, put the hand on there. You can see the hand right next to your name. This also applies, of course, to our speakers. So if they would like to, to say something, they can either do this sign or raise their hand digitally. So now I will hand over to Herfried. Please, Herfried, the floor is yours. Thank you, Uta. Uh, and thank you uh, to the distinguished panelists uh, for joining us. Um, it's a very strong uh, lineup we are having tonight. And uh, we are extremely grateful uh, for you to have the time, to find the time on a Friday evening. Um, I'm honored to represent the European Capital of Democracy Initiative here. Um, we are launching this initiative after one and a half years of preparations. Uh, one and a half years ago, here at the Innovation and Politics Institute, uh, we came up with this concept after asking ourselves the question what we could do to create a positive discourse on democracy in Europe. We were wondering how we could share real life experiments who, which are taking place every day in Europe by local governments who are working uh, for the people very hard and who are actually finding solutions for them and how we could ensure that others could get inspired and follow suit. Because as we believe, we don't hear enough about the many innovative forms of democracy that are being practiced in cities all over Europe. Instead, we hear in the news a lot about strongmen, about authoritarianism, about their claim that they represent the people, and also a lot of pessimism about democracy as a weak and old institution that is not uh, capable of innovation. And I think, and we think that this gives the very wrong impression that uh, they are winning. We believe that many people have this impression by now, although many people believe in human rights and democracy, and they want to preserve the planet at the same time. 
But the problem is they are swamped with bad news from everywhere about all the things, all the solutions that do not work. And we believe that this is a very dangerous tendency because we believe that hope is a very powerful political resource. If hope is taken away from us, we will be less courageous and we will be less creative. In the end, this leads to political cynicism or even worse. So we decided to change the political momentum and talk about what works in our democracy, putting the limelight on those constructive forces which deserve it and create a contest of democratic best practice with an annual selection of the European capital of democracy. How will this work? In order to become a European capital of democracy, citizens cities will have to apply with a curated program of what they intend to innovate in their democratic practice for their citizens. A jury of experts will evaluate their bid and make a short list of five cities. And those five cities will be submitted to a representative online jury of 10,000 European citizens from all the 47 member states of the Council of Europe who will decide the winner. The European capital of democracy of any year then will not only implement the curated program it has submitted to the jury. It will also serve as a stage for the European discourse on democracy in general. It will organize together with us and third partners, expert panels, political fairs, art festivals, all of them dealing with democracy and all of them taking place in this city. Also, our partner, the Schwarzkopf Foundation, has already pledged to have the European Youth Parliament to take place in these cities every year. And we know that many partners will follow with the specific tracks we are organizing. We will have a track dealing with the challenges and opportunities both for, both for democracy in the digital age. We will have a track on climate crisis and democracy. We will have a track on education and one on participation. We will do this with third partners, partners who believe as we do in the European Convention on Human Rights and who believe as we do that the time has come to act. So next spring, we will publish a call asking all European citizens to compete for this honorary title, all European cities to compete for this honorary title. They will have one year time to complete the bids so that our group of experts can assess the applications and submit a short list to the citizens jury. And in August 2022, the European citizens in our jury will vote. 15 September, as you know, is a dedicated international day of democracy. So on that day in 2022, the first elected European capital of democracy will be announced. Its program will start exactly one year later. There is some time to prepare for this implementation on 15 September 2023. In the meantime, we will work with two partner cities yet to be announced to volunteer as European capitals of democracy in 2021 and 2022. These first two cities will demonstrate how strong our ideas are and what can be done during a year of a city holding this wonderful title. The decision on those pilot capitals will be taken based on the content of the program in conjunction with our expert panel. Who, which, who those city pilot cities will be, we will tell you in the coming month, but I can assure you that there is already quite a lot of interest in this. So thank you. I just wanted to introduce uh, the concept of the uh, European Capital of Democracy at the beginning of this uh, round with uh, two distinguished panelists. Um, and I will start with uh, Prima Torvalo. Um, Uta has said at the beginning that we are already celebrating uh, the launch of the European Capital of Democracy since this afternoon. I don't know since when you since when you are celebrating uh, Pan Primator, but uh, I know it's your birthday today, so it's a special honor for us that you took the time uh, to be with us. Thank you very much. 
and um, thank you for being with us. Um, Mr. Lord Mayor, I have been in Bratislava when uh, you uh, could celebrate your electoral victory and uh, you have campaigned on a civic platform of urban development. Um, you gave me, in, in the midst of your campaign, you gave me a book, quite a heavy book, uh, with the program you had uh, developed together with uh, citizens forums in all over Bratislava. And um, it shows that you uh, had a very good way of uh, finding a good dialogue with citizens. Obviously, communication is... <laughs> What do you think made you so successful in this uh, campaign, but also now uh, after being uh, mayor of the wonderful city of Bratislava for some time now? Thank you very much. And again, uh, I'm happy I can be here. It's a nice uh, way to spend the uh, own, uh, own birthday to talking about democracy now, huh? right? And the cities, which is my absolutely uh, is a topic I like uh, a lot. Of course, if we are talking about populism, and that's a very important topic when we are talking about democracy today, it's absolutely crucial to, to understand that the, the main, main weapon against uh, populism is just doing on the level of our city's good work, to, do, to deliver a high quality service to our citizens. That's something which is the main thing and and one of the very important elements of course is communication that's what was your question about i think and communication is crucial in this way if you want to stay clear from populism but at the, at the same time you have to make a difficult de uh, decision communication between groups that uh, have a different but still legitimate interest it's very imp important and is absolutely necessary for a functional democracy uh, as well as the city, of course. Finding a common ground, common ground is absolutely necessary and is a key. I personally devote um, a great amount of time uh, and energy to 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 it. Uh, as an architect, that's my original profession. I believe that also the quality of public space impact uh, role models and behavior of people, and. Uh, if we are talking about communication, we need to talk, of course, about the public space because that's the that's the physical way how the city communicate with own citizens and inhabitants. So, I believe uh, is a physical element of, of communication for, for, from my point of view, and um, and that's it. Thank you very much. This viewpoint from an architect is very interesting, I think, and um, it's also interesting and important input for our initiative, uh, where we have uh, developed uh, 12 dimensions of democracy, uh, which we ask uh, applicant cities to think about when they put together a, uh, a bid for a European capital of democracy. And this issue of public space is one of those items. It uh, seems to us quite important uh, uh, in this regard. I mean, in, in everything connect for me in the public space, because as an architect, I work a lot uh, on this topic. And, uh, and it's something very, which is very important. And a lot of studies are already been done and talking about the importance of public space, not only for our cities, but also for our democracy. In fact, that before the social networks and so on. That was the main uh, social network where people can meet, uh, speak, see each other. And of course, it was, it, it was, and I still hope it is a space for our democracy where the, where the big meetings are happening and mm, things are, are moving forward. So uh, for me, it's like everything connected in this very important element of the city. Thank you. Uh, welcome you uh, once more. We are very proud to have you here uh, also tonight together with uh, with uh, Prima Torvalo. Um, and as you know, uh, we have had all the four Visegrad capitals now present in the different panels we organized this evening. We are very grateful and we are very honored by this. 
because uh, you have together sent a very strong signal to the world recently with launching the Pact of Free Cities. Um, it has raised a lot of interest and it has, I think, also given a very important signal to the outside world um, that uh, there are citizens forces, very strong citizens forces in the Visegrad countries um, that care about democracy. Um, Mr. Mayor, in your mind, uh, what is the special role of uh, your city uh, in countering the onslaught of illiberalism? Jó estét kívánok, én is. Good Köszönöm evening to all of you. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. This is really a major pleasure uh, for me to have the opportunity and speak uh, at uh, this distinguished uh, forum. First of all, uh, Mayor Matthews Vallo, happy, happy birthday to you, first and foremost. I have to say, actually, that uh, uh, my wife also has her birthday tonight, <laughs> today. So she is a very committed democ Democrat, and yes. therefore uh, she is going to forgive me for having the uh, birthday dinner very late at night. But I have a colleague here with me, Mr. Tomasz Iboya, a very fine and excellent uh, um, um, uh, assistant of mine, who also has a birthday today, so this is a very special day tonight. <laughs> Yes, indeed. We, uh, the region is in a very, very specific situation, the Visegrad region, I mean by that, because to a different extent, but in the recent years, what we have experienced was that our national governments do go against certain classical democratic values, while our capitals at the same time do belong to uh, are being led uh, by uh, uh, leaders uh, belonging to different party families different party groups but still all of them um, um committed to democracy and interested in deepening democracy now i'm a social scientist a social researcher uh, of social sciences and uh, i was one of the first persons who um, led uh, the first deliberative uh, uh, polls and uh, council uh, meetings with citizens and uh, with uh, with inhabitants. Therefore, I've been very long interested in how participative democracy could be renewed uh, with strong elements of participation. We very often say that democracy is in a crisis, but this is not necessarily a bad news, piece of bad news, because democracy has always been in crisis, because democratic governance has an internal imminent characteristic that they want to progress all the time and they want to give more and more say to people. We've been talking about populism a lot when speaking about our region. Populism has also been a certain response, a certain answer to a certain phenomenon. Um, to a, a, this was a bad answer, an incorrect uh, answer of participative democracy uh, to the problems uh, when the uh, division the, the of power had been depicted as something countering the people with the leaders, uh, putting a fence between the people, the, uh, the, the, the society, and uh, the establishment. Like, you know, constitutional courts uh, that uh, tie the hands of the government, or very strange institutions uh, that would just separate uh, the people, the voters, the electors from the government, the establishment. Each and every politician, sorry, each and every populist is not only talking about strong handed uh, politics and strong leadership, but they all depict and introduce their politics as if that was aiming at deepening democracy, whereas it is just uh, uh, dismantling the checks and balances in power. What is the good response to all that? Now, the good response is obviously we have to defend the institutions of the divisions of power, of branches of power. We have to defend uh, the institutions of democracy and checks and balances. Now, uh, local governments 
municipalities are also part of that because they are part of a, a, of a, a division of power. But people need to understand and need to be convinced that the decisions are not made above their head, but made together with them. Now, as classical democracy was born in cities because it's that that is the space where people are close to one another and it's true yes it's true uh, that it is public spaces that are very important because that's where people can uh, really have a, a discourse and can uh, communicate and they are not dependent upon someone representing them because they are close to one another physically Therefore, cities could have a very important role in creating uh, these institutions, deepening democracy. Our line of thinking is very similar. I mean, uh, the uh, city leaders of the capitals of the V4 countries, so all four mayors are very much on the same page. And we've learned, we've, we've been learning a lot from those urban practices, which urban practices have been successful in several places in Western Europe. Now, these institutions uh, are such that we want to introduce in Hungary and Budapest as well. Let me just give you two examples. One is that the uh, that we have launched and started to launch uh, the Climate uh, uh, Assembly of Budapest, the Budapest Climate Assembly, because climate change is really a cause that should be brought closer to people so that they can live that through and experience it. So it's very important to have such a climate strategy uh, that is made with the involvement of people, so a participatory climate strategy. Therefore, we have the Climate Assembly. We are creating the Climate Assembly, uh, which is a, a citizen's council on climate, in the framework of which representatives of the inhabitants of Budapest, 50 representatives of, uh, of the inhabitants of Budapest, uh, which would be representative in terms of uh, gender, in terms of age, in terms of uh, uh, location where they live within Budapest. So together with them, we are setting up and developing this strategy this strategy in such a way that they get information continuously, they can speak to experts, they can ask questions, they can have uh, debates and discussions, and they are the ones who can come up with, uh, with uh, suggestions and advice uh, to uh, the city as far as the strategy is concerned, the climate strategy. Now, this method is an ideal democracy in small, which has a very important uh, uh, component we know that we cannot share uh, complicated information and uh, in complex cases with everyone, that's impossible, but progressive politics is different from populist politics in the way that populists come up with simple and simplified answers, incorrect answers to complex questions. Whereas we, on the other hand, progressive politics is that we we undertake and, and agree that there are no simple answers to complicated and co questions and complex matters. Good questions are always complex and complicated. Uh, good answers are always complex and complicated answers. Now, a climate assembly as an institution is actually guiding social discourse to into this direction because we know that it is damn difficult, very difficult to come up with uh, uh, decisions that are acceptable to all. It's very difficult to um, see through and understand and uh, comprehend all these issues, but we still have to deal with it. We still have to take it on board. Now, the other project I would like to talk about uh, is uh, the uh, classical project of participatory budgeting. Now, in a, in a matter of weeks, we are going to launch our information campaign um, because we are seeking advice and ideas from the inhabitants of Budapest to come up with ideas how to use a certain part of uh, the budget of uh, the capital of Budapest. And this is going to be the adaptation of the French model, the Paris model. Uh, therefore, in the first months of next year, in February and March, uh, the, Budapest, the inhabitants of Budapest will have a direct uh, uh, say. They can directly decide upon how to spend this part of the budget, a sizable part of the entire budget of Budapest. And of course, in parallel, we have re 
planned and rebudgeted each and every investment that we inherited from the previous leadership. And also, as far as the new uh, investments are concerned, the new investment projects are concerned, we are launching participatory budgeting and participatory um, um, uh, planning. So it is a, in a participatory way that we make the decisions in certain parts and different parts and different areas of the city and city life. Now, I said that the pro progressive, uh, progressive politics is always complicated and complex, but let me now be very simple still. If there is a crisis of democracy, the answer is not less democracy. The good answer is always more democracy. Thank you very much for this extremely interesting uh, intervention. And, uh, and I think uh, starting out from the idea that crisis is not always a bad thing and, uh, and ending with the observation uh, that our answer must be more democracy, uh, not less. Uh, this, this was very, very helpful. I'm sure there are already some questions from the audience. So I'm turning over to, to Uta. Yes, thank you, Herfried. Indeed, there are questions from the audience. And thank you so much for participating in this discussion. Um, one one uh, member from the audience asked uh, a question to Mr. Vallo, who himself uh, is also an architect and urban activist. Uh, and the question is how urban development and, and how to shape public spaces uh, in order to connect people with each other and democratic politics. Situation because of COVID-19 uh, that we need to completely reth rethink, uh, rethink the, the notion of public space. Uh, in a way, the public space was the, was the space where we all, are, loves, we all love to meet and uh, we spent four months during the first wave of coronavirus to explaining to, to people that they don't need to be in the groups outside or inside, inside and that you, know, you have these images from different European cities and Bratislava was uh, one of these cities where you have completely empty streets. What uh, this crisis also give, uh, give us was absolutely uh, the thing which was also in theory sure or uh, clear that our cities uh, need their citizens. The empty streets are just sad. Empty streets are not working. We, if we want to have a good quality public space, it has to uh, it has to have this one element, which are the, the human element. Let's say. So now there is a this line of thinkers in architecture and urbanism, which are talking and thinking of what this kind of disease or this kind of crisis means for public space and what actually is going to be a future of public space. Um, it's very similar to, to public transport. I spent first year of my, of my uh, mayor, mayorality to, uh, to, to be a walking advisor, uh, the ad for, for using public transport. And when Corona arrived, I spend a lot of time to to explain to people that it's not a good idea to use some kind of box where you are all together. Uh, so we, I, I'm the old, in this in this way. I'm very old school. I, I want to be old school. I'm not thinking about some super futuri futuristic public space where everybody is alone. I'm still. Uh, hoping that we will have um, uh, again the public space which is crowded with people and and it's going to be to be typical place we love and uh, which is the one of the key elements of our cities thanks a lot thanks a lot that's a really important point you made um space for encounter coming together communication is is very important and imperative so uh, the second question actually uh, connects to this and it's addressed to uh, Lord Mayor Korashonje uh, and asking about, because he, he was talking about, uh, of course, populism and um, the regional surrounding of Budapest. We all know um, it's, it's, it's quite a tough job that uh, Lord Mayor is doing. 
So, Mr. Karashonia, how do you deal uh, uh, with and how do you counteract pressure from populist forces? This is one of the questions from the audience. Well, yes, indeed. It is an important sign of the crisis of democracy that we don't have real information in the public. We have we have semi-information, half information or de disinformation, false information or fake information. And this is the major problem when we try to stand up against populist forces. Now, if someone knows Hungarian media reality and the Hungarian media environment, then uh, there's no need to explain uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon or uh, this notion. But I think uh, it's quite, it happens quite often that I am not, I cannot make it to uh, the cover pages of uh, government media in positive uh, setup. Uh, but there were some days, uh, there were two days where 90% of the government media was, was dedicated to me. 90% of all uh, media was just uh, dealing with my things and with my person. Uh, therefore, there is a, a disinformation dumping, a false information dumping that they are, uh, an abundance of false information that they are dumping uh, the uh, the uh, population with uh, and then what gives me a peace of mind is that the same happened during the election campaign so i sort of got used to it or grew used to it uh, we cannot counterbalance that with quantity we don't have the means we can only counterbalance that with quality precise exact and directly disseminated and distributed information it is practically social media that we can use for communications we are very active in social media and in the first uh, few weeks of uh, the uh, pandemic, there was a very um, tough political battle or war between the Hungarian government and the, the leadership of Budapest. We had to defend ourselves against uh, very uh, petty uh, attacks. We actually, what we did, we shared each and every fact and each and every information with the inhabitants of Budapest. We publicized each and every document uh, through social media. And what we can trust uh, in is that uh, every information finally will make it to the uh, inhabitants. I'm not saying this is an easy war, but thanks God, the manipulative media uh, very easily um, unveils itself. So very easily, uh, they just, uh, you know, become naked. Because when they want to spread disinformation, then all of uh, after a while they just reach those who are living in bubbles in very narrow political bubbles now those who live in reality as opposed to that will dif will decide differently but it's as a matter of fact uh, is very it is sure and certain that uh, this uh, um, an unnecessary battle ties up a lot of energy and a lot of uh, effort of ours which we would not in under normal conditions we would we would not have to fight and uh, deal with now again Concerning one, the question that was asked from Matush, I would like to uh, say one thing about public spaces. Okay, now again, it is the sociologist uh, that will uh, speak uh, when I in my words, but it also has a social aspect. So the pandemic has a very important impact, a very important consequence, namely that everyone requires more space. Every person requires more space. Now, what is the what is the bottleneck? What is the uh, the most scarce resource in a city? Because a city is a city because there are a lot of people living together. Now, the scarcest resource of a city is public space. Everyone wants more public space. There are more cars in the street. They need more parking places to park their cars. In restaurants, people want to sit on the terraces. So uh, on the terraces, so um, caterer, caterers need more space. Uh, now, by cyclists, bicycle riders need more space as well. Uh, this is what's happening in Budapest, because during the pandemic, we, uh, we designated more bicycle lanes. And there is a conflict between um, uh, motorists, so car drivers and cyclists, um, who would have more of uh, the public roads, the road surface. Now, you cannot be just, you cannot be fair. You could, the only thing you can do is to listen to everyone and then to 
explain the final decision to everyone, uh, saying that it is not uh, that we favor one or the other group, uh, but we would like to um, use our public spaces in a wiser manner. Uh, this is a democratic debate. It's a good democratic debate within uh, cities, within urban areas. Thank you so much. These have been really great inputs, I think, for the audience as well, and maybe other cities to learn from it. Um, there is uh, indeed a question, I guess it's from Vienna, and I will just read it out also from uh, the YouTube uh, live stream chat. Cities uh, come with the promise of letting uh, the people shape the immediate area they live in. And in Vienna, for example, up to one third of permanent residents are disenfranchised. They are not eligible to vote because they lack formal citizenship. Some cities in Europe have independently put forward initiatives to grant participation to people with refugee status, uh, for example. And the question the, uh, the person from the audience has, are there any coordinated efforts within your network of mayors to expand participation, be it in elections or otherwise? This is a question to both of you. Uh, you, can, you can choose who wants to come first. Mr. Vallo, maybe you? I mean, uh, participation, and already my dear colleague Caraccioni, Gail Gale mentioned, it's one of the key elements of today's cities. And uh, what we are looking for is to do the real part. We, we are calling it real participation. I mean, in, in mainly in Bratislava and also in other Slovak cities, it used to be some kind of passwords more than I don't know, five years ago, 10 years ago, but it was always about some kind of PR. The, the local politicians always mistaken uh, the participation with some kind of PR stunt. So in a way that we ask the question, uh, citizen answer, but we don't use the answers. We doing own stuff, going all uh, on the own way. And, uh, we are trying to really, I established when I became mayor two years ago, um, a new institution, a think tank for Bratislava called Metropolitan Institute of Bratislava, which is the, the, the bold face of Bratislava, not only towards uh, developers, um, which they need some limits, but also to the questions about our vision or about the future in terms of uh, not pu only public space, but the uh, physical development of the city, let's call it. And of course, if we are talking about this very, very important topic, there is absolutely big necessity to to invite people in and to have a good instrument or how we are going to do this invitation to to be able to ask the right question and be able to listening and really and also be ready to change something if if the ideas and the answers are good. And uh, this is very simple, but I think it's one of the key elements of good participation. And uh, what we are trying to do is, uh, for example, if because there was a question also about the foreigners in, in the cities, as I understand. And uh, Bratislava, if you are a foreigner with a permanent uh, resident, you, you can vote in communal election. Uh, which is good, good thing, I think. Uh, anyway, anyhow, I'm trying to 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 know what's happening with our, the foreigners, which is uh, living in Bratislava, and I'm trying to reach out. And uh, I hope that they they also, even if they don't speak Slovak, will find a way have uh, to to prepare our participation processes also for them. Thanks a lot, Mr. Gorazonia. Budapest is a very is a, a, a metropolis where the whole world is present, obviously. And I also think that uh, 
the the fact that EU citizens, uh, even foreigners uh, who uh, are uh, who have just permanent residence in, in in Hungary, have the right to vote at municipal elections. Of course, Hungarians also exercise uh, these right of theirs in other European capitals, EU capitals, and I think this is a wonderful thing. Now, in my campaign last fall, I wanted to address these people separately, specifically. I don't have uh, data or feedback to what extent this was successful. I mean, that I address them um, specifically. But of course, the nationalist Hungarian government party said that, yes, it was the vote of the foreigners that made me uh, win the elections. <laughs> Which, let's face the fact, is, <laughs> is a bit ridiculous uh, to be uh, polite because mathematics, uh, the math wouldn't work at the end. The bottom line wouldn't. Um, wouldn't be correct. But again, I think it's not only the election campaign uh, that we should involve uh, foreigners, but also into the daily politics, the daily political activity of the city. Um, so we should involve them. And there is a very important forum thereof. Uh, we are working on the creation of a Budapest Global Council, uh, which uh, we are working, we have been working on with my colleagues. This would involve uh, uh, f foreigners, uh, citizens, uh, also uh, multinational companies, uh, also um, um, institutions, scientific institutions, foreign institutions. So all foreign entities would have a bigger say and a forum where they could um, um, let their voices be heard in terms of uh, urban politics and urban planning. We think that these people and these entities are very important resources for a metropolis. When they go home, for example, if they go back to their country of origin, then they should um, take these experiences uh, with them, these practices with them, uh, so that uh, they will spread the word that it's worth to come to Hungary, it's worth to come and invest here, it's worth to come here as tourists, and so forth. We would like to, uh, to activize them, to make them more active, because they are living here with us. And they are a big contributor to the, uh, to the diversity of the city, and they also are a component of perspective thinking. Therefore, we would like them to um, uh, to say their opinion and say uh, their their advices concerning the future of Budapest very much. I'm, I'm certain that uh, all of us would like to know more about this Budapest Global Council that you just uh, mentioned. It's, it's also a very good initiative. And uh, I don't see any more question from the audience, maybe a final statement or a health aid you would like to add something to it. I would like to thank you very much uh, for, for the input so far. This was a very intellectually challenging uh, and interesting uh, panel. Um, I think uh, what, what I hear also, also from the question is obviously that the concept of citizenhood and citizenship is quite important uh, when we talk about cities. And uh, the more open this is seen, uh, the more interesting this will also be for our European capital of democracy. Um, I, I remember uh, having read a historical uh, um, study uh, by Fernand Brodel on, on the most important uh, hubs in the world uh, trade over the last couple of hundred, over the last 800 years. And he proved that everywhere you can see that the most successful cities obviously were the most open cities um, the ones uh, who had uh, who had trade and who were open uh, to uh, not, not not just migration because it's not about migration but it's about trade um, uh, he showed uh, pictures of uh, of venice for example paintings of venice in the 14th century where you can see from the paintings uh, that uh, those rich people uh, present there were very often traders also uh, from outside. And this is also, I think, something that we must not forget uh, in terms of, of, of the democracy and cities, that uh, there is a completely different discourse of what constitutes a citizen in a city than of what constitutes a citizen in a, in a, national, uh, in a national environment. And I think this is, creates sometimes some tensions, 
but uh, it depends on us whether, as you said, uh, uh, Lord Mayor, whether we use a good uh, crisis to to good uh, to to a good use to to uh, put it to a good use, and and try to find new and innovative answers. Um, so uh, I, I don't have a, a new question. I'm very very much interested in your experience. You will collect with the with the citizen assembly. Um, and I think we will also get uh, back to to Matu Schwalo to uh, to ask him more about his ideas on uh, on public spaces, uh, how important they are in terms of uh, democracy, even in the 21st century, because we very often get this talk about, uh, you know, we electronic democracy and all of this, which is an important dimension. But as we all, I think, felt, and as you stated, uh, Pan Primator, during the lockdown, um, it's all quite nice to have these Zoom meetings, but it's uh, much nicer to meet in person. Uh, That's right. You, it, it gives you a different kind of energy. So, um, uh, but tonight we have shown, I think, that uh, even if we could not meet because of COVID, um, this was a very, very constructive and productive session. I would like to thank uh, the mayors of our most, of our nearest, closest capitals um, from Vienna, seen from Vienna. Um, thank you very much for joining us and for spending this Friday, Thursday evening. Also say hello and uh, all the best to, to your collaborator, Tomas, please. He had to stay as well. And to your wife, thank you for spending the time with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much and happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. Goodbye.